Hey everybody, it's Ribley back again. Let's talk about a special little vector situation called the cross product. I got a bunch of windows open here because I, I want to talk to you extensively about this before we get into the actual, not extensively, but a little bit, before we get into the actual mathematics of it. Um, cross products are, is a different vector operator, so operators with numbers, you know, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, etc. With vectors, we have the dot product, which we can do with any n-dimensional vector. We can dot any n-dimensional vector with any other n-dimensional vector. Cross products are different. We can only do cross products in three space. Okay, So you're not allowed to have vectors of, of degree greater than three when you're dealing with cross products. So let's talk a little bit about, I know a lot of you have already seen these in your physics courses, but I do want to uh, just spend a minute or two talking about what's going on. So I've got a little photo here. It's called the right hand rule. So notice it's with their right hand. And if I've got vector A heading in one direction and I spin uh, vector B off in another direction but in the same plane, if I cross A with B, the thumb pops out in that direction. And direction is really important with cross products. So in other words, the thumb isn't poking down the other direction. It's poking up at a right angle or orthogonal when we talk about vectors to these two vectors A and B. That's the right-handed rule. We'll talk about that more in class. I want to show you a quick little applet because this thing's really cool. Excuse me. All right, so check this out. What we've got here is clearly, now think about this before we do this. Think about the right-hand rule. Which vector is being crossed with which? Is A being crossed with, is blue being crossed with green or is green being crossed with blue. Well, according to the right-hand rule, if I were to cross green with blue, this red vector, which represents the cross product, would be punching down the, other, the opposite direction. However, this has to be the blue vector with the green vector because, according to the right-hand rule, as I wrap this guy into here, like you would wrap your fingers on your right hand, up pops the thumb and that's the, the direction that it goes. You see right down here, it says C equals A cross B, which is cool. Now watch this, because I just want you to notice a couple of things. And this is a little tricky because this is a crazy applet. Look at that. It's awesome. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, watch this. If I pull these guys back, predictably, the vector, the cross product vector shrinks. All right. Check it out. Also, watch this. If I make this, these two vectors, the green and the blue, be linear, watch what happens to the size. In other words, if the angle between the two vectors is 180 degrees, I have no cross product. So cross product is like, you got to commit to one side or the other of a right angle, or excuse me, <clears throat> of 180 degrees before you get to have a cross product. Now there's another thing that I want to talk about really briefly with you guys. Notice that in this applet, which is it's such a great applet, this little pink rectangle right here, or parallelogram right here is it, why, would, like, why would they emphasize that? Well, one of the definitions of a cross product is that the magnitude of this vector is always equal to the area of this parallelogram. We're actually going to prove that in this video. It's not going to take too long. So as that thing grows and I make it bigger, the size of that, of that cross product grows as well. So I pull these guys out and make it bigger. Look at what happens if I, make it, if I shrink it in. Look at what happens, it gets smaller, okay? So there is our uh, little introduction to what the cross product is. In, in the next little section, we'll get into some heavy mathematics, but don't be afraid. At the end of the day, there's gonna be a couple of formulas that you're gonna absolutely have to know because they're super helpful, and then some rules and laws of cross products. So I'll see you back in, in uh, just a few seconds, and we'll start talking about the mathematics of cross products. Okay, now that we've been introduced to the sort of the theoretical idea of a cross product, let's get down to the nitty gritty and do a couple of proofs or just one proof with you. Let's, I'm gonna, I'm, <laughs> slow down, Ripley, that's caffeine. Um, I'm gonna talk to you, give you the formal mathematical definition of a cross product first, but I wanna talk about these vectors in terms of how our author addresses vectors. So I'm gonna let A, equal the vector a1, a2, a3, or we can think of this as a1i plus a2j plus a3k, etc., etc., right? And I'm going to let b equal b1, b2, b3, 
three, and I'm going to use a little lazy notation here and just go ta da, right? We just use a little quotation to mean <clears throat> means uh, along the same lines, right? So a cross b is defined as, and you're going to freak out when you first see this, but don't freak, don't panic. I promise it's easy. This is going to be a two b three minus a three b two comma a three b one. We're going to prove this also, by the way. Minus a1, b3, and then comma, and we've got a1, b2, b2, minus a2, b1. Let me show you where this comes from and kind of how it, it was developed. If you think about it, remember cross product has to be at a right angle to the plane that is created by both A and B. So if I'm gonna have, if, if A cross B is truly the cross product of A and B, like we just spoke about, then I know that it's gonna be orthogonal to both of those vectors. So I know that A cross B, if I take this thing and I dot it with either A, or if I dot it with B, I know in both cases this is going to equal zero. So there's some sort of algebraic tomfoolery that we're not actually going to get into because it, 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 it's kind of unnecessary in terms of coming up with a formula and its utility. But we can explore that in class if you would like to. This looks really intimidating, but let me show you how it's actually pretty useful. Well, all I'm going to do is I'm going to take determinants, which we learned way back in algebra, what, algebra two? I'm gonna put an I, a J, and a K here, sort of predictably, all right? And then I'm gonna put an A1, whoops, an A1, an A2, and an A3. So the top level of this, um, well, it's not a matrix, it's gonna be a determinant when everything is said and done, is going to be those placeholders for three-dimensional vectors. And then the next row is gonna be the, the row that represents the vector A, and then I'm gonna have B1, B2, and B3. And then I simply take the, the determinant of that, all right? Which is kind of a neat little algebraic consequence of the way in which A cross B is defined. So what do I get? If you recall from your algebra two, if I want the determinant of this, I take this guy, upper left-hand corner, and then I take the two by two determinant of this lower right hand corner two by two. So I would get A2 B3 minus A3 B2 and I would take that and I would multiply that times I. Now that's again, that, that was when we were doing vector algebra way back in algebra two. Now hopefully you remember the next one is gonna be, I'm gonna take this J and I'm gonna take this, I'm gonna do A1 B3 and A3 B1 but I have to subtract it. So I'll actually get rid of that plus I could also do the, the, the determinant in reverse order, which would produce the same algebraic result, but we'll, we'll just keep it simple. This is going to be A1, where am I? B3 um, minus A3, B1. And then this guy is going to be times J. And then last but not least, I'm going to add, I'm going to grab the upper right-hand corner, and I'm going to take the 2 by 2 determinant over here. So I end up with A1, B2 minus A2, B1. And this is times k. And if we look at that, let's see, this gives me, look, look compare that to this sort of strictly um, algebraic notation up here. I've got a2b3 minus a3b2, got that. And then I've got, oh goodness, a3b1 minus a1b3. Well, this is a1b3 minus a3b1, but there's this negative out in front. So that flips it around. And then last but not least, that's this guy, I've got a1b2 minus a2b1. And I've created a, an easy way for us to be able to use, um, um, excuse me, matrices to create cross products. And it, this may seem a little cumbersome initially, but you'll get really, really good at it. And wink, wink, nudge, nudge, you could probably create um, a program that would do it in your calculator pretty easily. But you are going to have to be able to do it by hand. All right, so we now officially have a way to compute a cross product of two vectors. Remember, cross product of two vectors produces a vector. It's orthogonal to both of the vectors from whence the cross product came. Um, remember, a dot product produces a scalar. I always have to kind of remind myself of what I'm looking at. If I'm looking at a cross product 
as a vector or if I'm looking at a dot product as a scalar. Okay, so I'm gonna look at something a little crazy here and you guys are gonna be like, where did this come from? I'm gonna look at the magnitude of A cross B squared. Now you, you gotta remember the magnitude of a vector. If I take any vector, its magnitude is gonna be the square root of A squared plus B squared in three dimensions that is, whoops, plus C squared, right? So if I square it, the, the um, square root goes away. But I'm taking the magnitude of A cross B and I'm gonna square that thing. So I'm gonna have A two B three minus A three B two, and I'm gonna square that. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm gonna factor that negative out right there. So what I'm gonna, it really doesn't matter, but I'm gonna go plus, don't worry about it. I'm gonna go A three B one minus A one B three. It will be three, which we know is what we need. And I'm gonna square that, and then I'm gonna go plus. So I guess I didn't really factor the negative out, but I could have if I wanted to, right? Because when you square it, the negative disappears. I might use that trick later. Um, a one b two minus a squared b one. And then if I square these guys, I'm gonna do sort of one of those cooking show poof, and this is what you get, so that we don't have to. I don't have to pain you with everything. So I get a two squared b. 3 squared minus 2a2, a3, b2, b3. I'm reading this directly off my rip notes in case you couldn't tell. Plus a3 squared. You guys are running this at like two times speed anyway, right? So it's got to be hilarious. b2 squared plus, now that's that first term if I multiply this guy up. And then this is going to be plus um, a3 b1 squared minus 2a1a3b1b3 and this is going to be plus um, a1 squared b3 squared and then last but not least that so this this chunk right here picks up that guy squared and then I'm going to go plus a1 squared b2 squared minus two a one b whoops well it doesn't matter does it b one a two b two and then plus a two squared b one squared right just multiplying those out just a big fat foil thing okay now from this and this is again this is a little cooking show magic right here you could factor you could you can pull all sorts of factors out and I'll sort of leave it to you to look at to see how I did it, but it's not that big of a deal. It's actually quite easy. If I go a one squared plus a two squared plus a three squared times b one squared plus b two squared. Again, just a little bit of algebra here. Don't be afraid. And that, whoops, that's supposed to be, a, no, 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 plus b three squared, b three squared, and I'm I just factoring this guy. If I group terms and then sort of play with it, I get what I'm writing down right now. And this is a1, b1, plus a2, b2, plus a3, b3. And this guy is squared. Now, again, I, we've all had algebra. I've pounded algebra into you for the last several years. So you can play with this, but I don't want to take a ton of time. But let's look at what we got. What is this? Let me change colors real quick. What is this? Like if I'm looking at this, what is that? Well, that's the magnitude of A squared, isn't it? I mean, A, I know that vector A is A1, A2, A3. So this is just going to be magnitude of the vector A squared. Likewise, this is going to be the magnitude of vector B squared. And then this is, what's this? Well, a1, b1 plus a2, b2 plus a3, b3 is just a dot b. So this guy is a dot b, and that guy is squared. Right? Nothing to it. Now, if you remember correctly, how do we get, this is where it gets kind of fun. I remember that cosine of theta is equal to a dot b over magnitude a magnitude b, right? So I know that a dot b squared, if I do just a little bit of algebra, this implies that a dot b squared is going to be magnitude, whoops, is going to be magnitude of a times
times the magnitude of b times cosine of theta, and that whole thing squared. I just did a little algebra, right? Solve for a dot b and square everything because I'm trying to account for it here because I don't want dots and, and magnitudes mixed up if I can avoid it. So this thing turns into magnitude of a squared magnitude of b squared minus, now this is just magnitude of a squared magnitude of b squared, I'm just squaring this guy, cos squared theta, right? Now what's begging to happen? Well, let's factor out a magnitude of a squared magnitude of b squared, and I get times one minus cos squared theta. Those are th my thetas are awful, aren't they? And then, what do we know about one minus cos squared? It's sine squared. So I have magnitude of a squared magnitude of b squared sine squared theta. And you may be going, Ripley, why did we do all that? Well, look, something magic's about to happen. Remember what all this, if we follow the equal signs back, this is equal to magnitude of a cross b squared. If I take the square root of everything, now you gotta be careful with square roots of things that are squared because you end up with the absolute value, but think about sine. The absolute value, this would apply, right? Sine is always positive from zero to pi. So as long as we're talking about angles between zero and pi, which is what the cross product deals with anyway, I know that this implies that a cross b, the magnitude of that vector, is equal to the magnitude of a times the magnitude of b sine theta. Now, again, I don't know if you're if you're kind of connecting the dots yet, but if you see, if you look at this bad boy, uh, what what is a b sine theta? Well, we've seen a b sine theta. I'm going to put my notes over here. It's not the greatest way to do it, but remember, if I have a triangle with side a and side b, and this included angle theta, I remember that the area of that is equal to one half a b sine theta. That's from pre-calc. So if I double this guy, if I take, oh wow, this is a really bad use of notes. If I double this guy, I get this parallelogram, right? Basically twice the area of the original triangle. So that tells me that this implies that a b sine sine theta is equal to the area of the parallelogram. Parallelogram. Now, I'm going to show you something back in that applet here in just a sec, because this guy is telling me that I have the area of a parallelogram, not just any parallelogram, the parallelogram that's created by these two vectors in space. I'm going to draw that a little better, because that may be a little confusing. So, bam, let's call this A. Let's call this B. There's those horizontal lines again. I'm talking about this parallelogram right there. Now, I'm going to pop back really quickly to that applet so you guys can see. Move this guy out of the way. And let's look at this. Why does, a, why does, why, yeah, I guess why, why does the applet include this parallelogram no matter where I move? Well, because the magnitude of that cross product is equal to the area of that parallelogram is pretty darn cool. That is another way to define, excuse me, that is another way to define a cross product. A cross product is a vector whose magnitude is equal to the area of the parallelogram that is created by the two vectors that created the cross product, which is pretty cool. Okay, I've been yapping long enough. I know you guys are probably tired of hearing me talk. Here's what I need you to do. I need you to find the properties of the cross product as part of your notes. I'm going to check to see if they're there. I'm going to take all of the notes points off if they're not if, if they're not there. And I'm going to tell you right now, they're in the section about cross products. I want you to write them down. All right. If I write them down in my notes here, then chances are some of you won't have them in your notes because you will not have written them down. I want you to write them down. It's in the section on cross products. There are six of them. So please check those out. I'll see you tomorrow in class. Thanks for listening, and uh, have a great day. Bye-bye.